Reverend Terry M. Turner is the pastor of the Mesquite Fellowship Baptist Church. He accepted his calling to ministry while studying broadcast journalism at Langston University, and he began his service in his hometown of Guthrie, Oklahoma, serving as assistant to the pastor and later as the senior pastor of the Mount Zion Baptist Church. He began his formal ministry training at the King is Coming Bible Institute in Oklahoma City and later studied at DTS, receiving both the MABS and the MACE degrees. After graduating from DTS, Pastor Turner organized and planted the Mesquite Friendship Baptist Church in Mesquite, Texas. Beginning with five families, the church now has over 2,100 members. He initiated the Bible Truth Ministries radio broadcast, which is now aired five days a week. And additionally, he serves on both the executive board and the administrative committee of the Southern Baptist Convention of Texas. He is married to his sweetheart, Nancy. They have three children, a one son-in-law, and we share the distinction of having one granddaughter each. Would you join me in welcoming Reverend Terry Turner to our platform this morning? Shall we bow? Most holy and eternal Father, we are grateful, we are thankful for this hour, for this day, and for this time. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of preaching to this thy people. We ask that you would honor your word today and bless the lives of these students that they may be made the better when they have left this place today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. And we thank you for your goodness. We ask now that you would allow the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, to truly be acceptable in your sight. For indeed, Lord, you are our strength and you are our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We thank God for this opportunity, for this privilege, for this time. I don't take this lightly today because it's an opportunity to speak to the children of God who mold and shape our moral society. And so I ask for your prayers to Dr. Bailey, to this fine and wonderful staff that I am so grateful and indebted to for the years of training that I experienced here at Dallas Theological Seminary. Truly, I am the better, and my ministry has been the more fruitful because I habited these hollowed walls. And if I start calling names, I'll miss somebody. But I see so many of the faces whose classes I sat in and learned for hours and hours and thought to myself, will these guys ever run out of words? <laughs> and they never did. But indeed, I'm grateful to be here today. Uh, Chaplain Bryant sang what to me is the battle hymn uh, for ministry in my life. Whenever I am going through a struggle or I am burdened down with the cares of ministry, I simply remember a mighty fortress is my God, a bulwark never failing. And he seems to give me strength from those words. And so I asked him to sing that today. And, and not only that, I knew he'd break out his trusty trumpet. <laughs> and it was good to hear Chaplain Bill play the trumpet again after many, many years. Well, he told me also I only had a few minutes to speak. And uh, of course, you know how it is when you tell a preacher he's only got a few minutes. Uh, he tends to take longer than he's actually given. Uh, but one of the things I learned here at DTS is to be short, snappy, and brief. And then not only that, my pastor used to tell me, stand up, speak up, and shut up. <laughs> and so I think I'll do that today. In the second letter of Timothy, the second chapter, Timothy has become one of my favorite books as I endeavor to do ministry. Ministry. 
there's a word from the Lord. And I'm grateful today for a woman who has been beside me for 22 years. And I don't think she's actually missed but maybe one or two of my sermons. And she's here today, my wife Nancy, who is also a student here at DTS. Why don't you give her a round of applause? She's a wonderful pastor's wife. But in the second chapter of Timothy, beginning at verse 1, but we want to really focus in on verse 15. It says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. If a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husband man that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. He says, study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hallelujah. I want to talk briefly to you today from a subject, a diligent testimony. A diligent testimony. When I think about this life that we are called to live as Christians and believers, all that we really have in this life is what people say about us and what people see us to really be in life. Our testimony is our witness. When we said that we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, from that day forward we began to live a life of testimony saying that Jesus is the Lord of our lives, all that are living are to be to give him glory and to give him praise. When I stop to think about the movie The Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson, we saw in that movie a portrayal of something that we have seen many, many times in our lives or read about, but we never really saw it with such graphic detail. And when I thought about Christ's passion and how he suffered and everything that he went through and how he was diligent through the midst of all of the hardships that we might have a right to the tree of life, it said to me that just as Christ was diligent in his going to the cross, giving up his life, that we as well should be diligent in our Christian testimony and the life that we live for the Lord. And so today, as we look at it, there are four points that I really want to bring out to you. 
I want us to understand that the word diligent is a word that means to us hard working or painstaking. It means to have things done with care and hard work. But there are four aspects of life and living that I believe we really ought to be diligent in. One is that we ought to be diligent to know the culture in which we live. As we live our lives, we ought to study the culture, we ought to look at the culture, and we ought to understand the culture around us. Because unless we understand the culture, we will not know the warfare that is given for us to wage in our generation. Every generation changes. Every generation is different. When I was a young man growing up in, in my teens, it, it, was the, it was the 60s and the 70s. And that was a hippie culture. And, and everybody was about letting their hair grow long and having love for free and, and doing things that were uh, not in accord with the movements of the regular world or society of that day. Cultures constantly change. We live in a world today where we are bombarded with the X generation and their hip hop culture. And in the midst of that, Satan is moving in the midst of the hip hop generation, just as he moved in the midst of the hippie generation. There are many who are surrounding me today who still have scars from the hippie generation. And there will be many who, after the hip-hop culture has changed and gone off the scene, that will have many scars from the uh, hip-hop culture. When you look around, hip-hop causes everybody to, who is a part of it to put earrings in their ears, to tattoo their bodies. All of these markings, they, and they forget that one day they're going to grow old. <laughs> and tattoos don't look good. Always on wrinkled skin. <laughs> and so we must be abreast of what the devil is doing in the midst of our world. Study your culture. And you know one of the things that, that happens in our world is culture tends to want to dictate to the church what the church ought to do. Instead of the church dictating to culture what the culture ought to be about. We are to be about changing the world, not the world changing the church. Too often the church looks much like what the world looks like. Instead of the church developing its own presence in the world, its own views for the world, and then demanding that the world accept us as we are and the changes that we require in our world. And so when we look at it, we ought to be about changing culture. And then we ought to be about being diligent in knowing oneself. It's important that we know ourselves. It's important that we understand who we are in ministry. It's important that we understand who we are in the world. You see, most of us understand that we are sinners. And we've all come short of the glory of God. And yet at the same time, we want to act like our flesh is not real and present in the world today. When everything in the world wants to draw our flesh unto itself. But we must know ourselves. You must know that if you have a problem with pornography, stay away from pornography sites. You must understand that if you have a problem with alcohol, stay away from the liquor store. You do know there are spirits in there, don't you? <laughs> Every time you pass by one of those liquor stores, one of those spirits will reach out and put a taste in your mouth. And if you know yourself well enough, you are able to live your life in such a way where you can have a diligent testimony. And then we ought to understand that in knowing ourselves, it was just as I was when I came out of seminary. I came out and I had studied theology and I had studied Christian education and I, and I was prepared to teach the world. And I had words that nobody knew in the world. <laughs> and I came out and I began to use those words. 
And I, I noticed that people really weren't listening. They really didn't want to hear what I had to say because I was talking above their head. And finally, my loving wife came to me and said, you're just too arrogant. You need to come down to earth. And when I realized that in all of my learning, I had to make some changes about my life. I had to come down to the level where people really lived and began to preach a gospel that people really understood. See, it's not about the big words, but it's how simple you can make the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, folk are not saved by your intelligence, but they are saved by the simplicity of knowing that Jesus died on an old rugged cross and rose early Sunday morning to forgive us of our sins. And so we ought to know ourselves well enough in life. To be able to minister as a minister or a preacher. Or to minister as a lay person. And most of us who are in here today are caught up with the things of the world. A whole lot of movements from the world are in the church. And we find ourselves wrestling with them and we don't even realize that we are wrestling with them. Most of us have caught on to that health, wealth, and prosperity ministry. Our thinking is, is that all of us ought to be rich. Let me see the hands of everybody in here rich. You know Jesus, don't you? There's a ministry out there that says that if you are blessed by the word, you ought to run down and throw money on the pulpit because you've been blessed by the word. Well, I don't know what I'm preaching. Nobody's run down to throw any money on the pulpit yet. <laughs> But at the same time, there, there's a movement out there that we catch on to. And it's not about how much money we have. It's not about how great our ministry is. But it's about how well do we know Jesus. How much have we accepted him as our personal savior? How many folk are we leading to know Jesus in the parting of their sins? And so you ought to endeavor to know yourself. And then you ought to be diligent to know the Word of God. And that word diligence simply means here in knowing the Word of God, you ought to stay focused on the Word of God. You ought to be committed to the Word of God. You ought to live your life in such a way that the Word of God takes precedence in everything that you say and do. See, most of us run around when we deal with the Word of God, we want to be politically correct. In dealing with God's word. Well, let me tell you something. It is not about being politically correct. But it's about being biblically correct. See, folk who are politically correct. Going to wake up one day and find themselves in hell. Y'all do know there's a hell. And y'all recognize folk are going there, right? But folk who will stay with the word of God will one day hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. The faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. And then you ought to be diligent to live a holy life. You ought to be studying to know how to live your life in such a holy way. You know, in the day that we live in, the word holiness to, to the world has become a bad word. But to us as believers, it ought to be a cherished word. It ought to be a word that we hold dear to our heart. Because God says, I am holy. And we ought to be holy just like God is holy. We ought to live our lives in such a way where God will be pleased with our lives. And so the background of the text is that Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, Timothy, I know you're going through some struggles with the issues of the world. And I understand that Hymenaeus and Philetus are spreading false doctrines in the midst of the church. We live in a world today where there are all kinds of false doctrines, my brothers and sisters. As a, as a pastor, I wrestle with them daily. Folk are saved and bought into the church and we don't know what background they came from. 
But it becomes the job of the pastor, the job of the leaders, the job of the ministers in the church to take that person and their bad doctrine, their bad teaching, to shape it into a doctrine and teaching that God is pleased with. And so I find myself many times wrestling with folk who come from different denominations, different backgrounds, different teaching that is not right, and correcting them according to the word of God. Now, everybody's not teachable. Hymenaeus and Philetus were not teachable. They made the decision that they were going to continue on in their erroneous ways, regardless of what Paul had done. And if you look at 1 Timothy, the 20th verse, 1 Timothy, the first chapter, and the 20th verse, you will find that Paul had to put them out of the church. Paul dismissed them, and he turned them over into the hands of Satan. But yet, here they are still in 2 Timothy, still in the church. And you'll find some folk, when you put them out, they'll just come right back the next Sunday and join over again. Put them out that Sunday, they'll come back the next Sunday. With their same struggles, with their same battles, with their same warfare. And so they came back and they began to fight. And Paul says, look, I understand you're wrestling with them. And I understand that in your wrestling with them, Timothy, you're a young man. And here's how you wrestle. And that's what he gives them, him in verse 1 through verse 14. Is how to wrestle and to deal with. The struggles and the issues of folk who have bad doctrine within the church. He says, first of all, be strong in the grace of the Lord. Verse 1. In verse 3, he says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He says, no man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. He says, look, live your life in such a way that you are pleasing to God, not about being pleasing to man. Too often we want to please the folk who smile in our face every day. Too often we want to please the folk that we go to church with. But let me tell you, the folk that you live with every day don't have a heaven or a hell they can put you in. You got to be pleasing to the Lord. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, verse 5, he says, If a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. If you are going to play in the game, if you are going to be in this effort of living the Christian life, you've got to strive according to the rules. And the rules are mandated by God himself. The rules have not been mandated to us by society or the movements of our society. But the rules have been mandated by God. Starting to feel pretty good here now. (laughs) But at the same time, in verse 6, he says, The husband man that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. That we must learn to live what we teach. If you are going to be the husband man and you are going to take care of the vineyard, you have the right to eat of what that which you raise first of all. And likewise, if you are going to teach the gospel, preach the gospel, you must be also the first one to live the gospel. Too many preachers today want to preach it, but they don't want to live it. Too many Christians want to teach it, but they don't want to live it. God is calling us to some holy living. God is calling us to some right living. God is calling us in this wicked and corrupt generation to turn our backs on the world of the devil and stand for Jesus Christ. Finally, he says in verse 9, he says, wherein I suffer trouble. The trouble that Paul was suffering was Hymenaeus and Philetus sharing with others that the resurrection had already happened. It was already over with. It was already past. And because the resurrection was over, it took everything that was of real significance out of Paul's gospel. You take the resurrection 
out of our Christian life and we don't have a whole lot to live for. Because it's all about living and suffering for Jesus in this world. And then understanding that when we have come to the end of our journey, that we will not stay dead. That some glad morning, when this life is over, when the trumpet shall sound, we who have died in Christ will be caught up in the middle of the air. And forever be with the Lord. That's what it's all about, my brothers and sisters. I'm striving for that day. I'm working painfully for that day. I'm going diligently to live my life in such a way that when I stand before the judgment bar of God, I have rightly divided the word of truth. And I will not need to be ashamed of the gospel that I have preached. I will have stood and said, a sin was a sin. Wrong was wrong and right was right. And I stood where God demanded that I stand. And I'll not need to be ashamed. Because I have rightly divided the word of truth. Be diligent in rightly dividing. Be diligent in your testimony. And if you are diligent in your testimony, the day will come when God will say, well done.